Sometimes all it takes is one wrong move by a queen. So many times throughout history, there have been mistresses and concubines waiting for their time to pounce and take power for themselves. Too many kings have often had far too many mistresses. Mistresses who have poisoned and cursed and even fought as men alongside their possible future husbands, all in the attempt to become the favorite. These are the stories of some mistresses, those who would do nearly anything to become queen, but fell just short. Ines Pérez de Castro de Valadetes, a Castilian noblewoman, holds a special place in Portuguese history for her tragic love affair with King Pedro I, or soon to be King Pedro I. Despite her Castilian roots, her tomb at the Alcobasa Monastery, lying opposite that of her royal lover, has made her story a well-known one for generations of Portuguese schoolchildren, which is weird because it's very much rated R. Ines arrived in Portugal in 1339 as a lady-in-waiting to Infanta Constanza of Castile, who was marrying Pedro, the heir to the Portuguese throne. Though Pedro was married to Constanza, he immediately fell in love with the young Ines. After Constanza's death in 1345, Pedro's father, King Alfonso IV, became alarmed at his son's open affair with Ines and her family's growing Castilian influence. The fear was that Portugal might be in danger of falling to their Iberian neighbors. So in 1344, Alfonso had Ines in prison to separate the lovers, but after Constanza's death, Pedro brought Ines back against his father's wishes. Rumors spread that Ines and her family were scheming to disinherit Pedro's legitimate son, Fernando, in favor of Ines's children. Then in 1355, while Pedro was away, the king sent assassins to take out the 29-year-old Ines at a convent. They removed her head, right there in front of her own children. I mean, who does that? Those guys did. Pedro's devastation led to civil war against his father. When he finally became king in 1357, he declared he had secretly married Ines, legitimizing their children. In a show of vengeance, two of Ines's assassins were executed by having their hearts torn out. Though likely fictional, legend claims that Pedro later exhumed Ines's body and forced the court to kiss her dead hand as though she were queen. Yeah, that'd have been a hard pass for me. In 1940, a previously unknown autobiographical novel from the Kamakura period, which lasted from 1185 to 1333, titled Tawaza or A Tale No One Asked For, was discovered by a scholar named Yamagishi Tokuhei in the Imperial Household Library in Tokyo. It was a rare and significant find. Most surviving literature from that era consisted of imitative works rather than original stories. The Toa was written by a mysterious figure named Lady Nijo, a concubine of an emperor one who, instead of rising to become queen, became a Buddhist nun. Now that's a hard pivot, but one that actually wasn't that uncommon for many Japanese concubines who realized they would never make it to the top. That'd be kind of like taking a coaching job after you realize you're never going to make it to the show in baseball. Lady Nijo came from an aristocratic family. Her father was a chief counselor of state who descended from the powerful Minamoto clan, and her mother served as wet nurse and lover to the ex-emperor Go Fukakusa. At just 14 years old, Nijo was made a lady-in-waiting and concubine to the aging Go Fukakusa, thanks to an agreement between him and her father. She remained devoted to the ex-emperor but never achieved the highest rank of consort. Now, This might be because of the fact that she had a few other side flings while she was a concubine of the emperor, including one with a noble from a rival clan. You see, when you're a side piece, you cannot have a side piece. I need to put that on a t-shirt. After her father's early death and the passing of the son she had with Go Fukakusa, Lady Nijo was sent into exile in 1283 at the age of 25, allegedly due to jealousy from the ex-emperor's main consort. Following her father's dying wish, she became a Buddhist nun and spent years traveling to temples before writing her memoirs. The Tawazugatari provides some pretty rare insight into the life of a court lady, but Lady Nijo likely had her own motivations in writing it. According to scholars, the work seemed aimed at defending her reputation and creating an idealized version of herself in order to restore her family standing and associate them with the ex-emperor. As she wrote, that all my dreams might not prove empty, I have been writing this useless account. Lady Nijo probably didn't expect her account to survive very long, but it did. It's one of the rare first-hand perspectives on life in the Kamakura Imperial Court that continues fascinating scholars around the world today. Madame de Montespan had a calculated approach to becoming the mistress of French King Louis XIV. She was full of charm and beauty, sure, but she was also full of patience and was able to play the waiting game as Louis enjoyed the affection of both his queen and his mistress and Montespan's friend, Louise de la Valliere. 
Madame de Montespan seized her chance when both the Queen and Louise de la Valliere were pregnant in late 1666, leaving the king feeling lonely and, you know, feeling other things. Unlike some of Louis XIV's other mistresses, she handled the situation with poise and an appetite for the bedroom that was pretty prolific by any standards. Madame de Montespan proved to be an insatiable match for the notoriously lustful King Louis XIV. Courtiers claim they, let's say, engaged in intimate relations at least three times a day, and the king sometimes wouldn't even wait for her entourage to leave before kicking things off. Madame de Montespan's influence over the king eventually drew a lot of resentment from many at court, but things soon took a darker turn. When investigations into alleged poison plots and black magic began, her name surfaced repeatedly, with witnesses accusing her of collaborating with a notorious poison dealer named only as La Voisine. One witness claimed that they used black magic rituals to maintain the king's affections for her. Shocking tales emerged, including accusations that Madame de Montespan participated in a black mass where a priest performed rites over her naked body while praying to the devil. While unproven, the damage to her reputation was irreparable, and she remained at court for a decade after her downfall, never regaining her status and watching the king take another mistress before finally retiring to a convent. Jeanne Antoinette Poisson, better known as Madame de Pompadour, rose from a humble background to nearly becoming the Queen of France. And even though she never achieved her ultimate goal, she did help make France the hoity-toity art and culture mecca we know it as today. In 1790, when she was just nine, Jeanne Antoinette's mother took her to a fortune teller who told them that one day she would reign over the heart of a king. From then on, she took the nickname Reynette, or Little Queen. The best tutor started coming to her home. She was taught dancing, theater, drawing, painting. In short, she was being groomed to become the mistress of Louis XV. That was the goal to become the mistress. Now, when she was 19, Jeanne Antoinette married a nobleman named Charles Guillaume Le Normand Guetteur. But then she got in cozy with the court of the king. Knowing Louis XV was on a honey trip near her estate, she was determined to catch his eye. While she was following the royal hunting party, she managed to maneuver in front of the king once while riding in a pink carriage with a blue dress. She then apparently somehow changed into a pink dress and swapped carriages, this time choosing a blue one and crossed the king's path again. Apparently, she knew the king's preferred color combinations. Plus, being beautiful didn't hurt either. Louis ended up sending her a romantic bouquet of venison meat. I mean, she did catch his eye while he was hunting. And nothing says love like venison. Louis then invited her to Versailles for a masked ball, where he disguised himself as a yew tree and then, I guess, flung off his tree mask and declared his love for Jeanne Antoinette, who was dressed up as Diana the Huntress in a nod to their color-coordinating hunting encounter. Jeanne Antoinette quickly became the king's primary mistress and lady-in-waiting to the queen, the highest possible honor for a woman in a French court. He gave her the Marquisade of Pompadour, complete with title, coat of arms, and an estate, and Jeanne Antoinette became Madame de Pompadour. She quickly became what basically amounted to a prime minister. Pompadour was involved in some major foreign policy decisions and always had the ear of the king. As a patron of art and culture, Pompadour made Paris the capital of taste and culture in Europe. She championed French pride through projects like establishing the famous Sev porcelain factory. She patronized tons of prominent artists of the Rococo style like Boucher and Natier. Pompadour herself was a bit of an artist, dabbling in gem engraving, acting, and printmaking. Though Pompadour began as the king's mistress, by around 1750, their relationship became one without the bedroom aspect to it. Instead of lover, Pompadour transitioned to the role of the king's closest friend and confidant. She was apparently quite ill during this time, and there was a bit of pressure on the king during the Jubilee year to repent his sins, one of them obviously being adultery. But in the end, Madame de Pompadour would never become queen, but she certainly acted like one. Catherine Agnette was a 20-year-old courtier when the 46-year-old French king Henri IV, recently widowed after the death of his mistress, Gabrielle Destre, fell for her charms. Before surrendering her virtue, though, the opportunistic Catherine demanded 100,000 crowns from the king. Catherine managed to coax Henri into providing her a written promise that he would marry her and make her queen. Catherine flaunted this promise in front of the courtiers like a kid showing off a new toy at the playground. The thing is, though, Henri didn't honor the promise and instead made the politically motivated move of marrying Marie de' Medici of the powerful Italian Medici family. Now, whether or not Henri actually agreed to the contract is up for debate. Some think she might have forged it, and Henri just did his best 17th century version of this woman's tripping. 
Now, despite all this, Catherine remained the king's mistress and also served as lady-in-waiting to the new Queen Marie. But she was a lady-in-waiting with an attitude. She was apparently perpetually disrespectful towards the queen. Now, we don't know so many details about how, but we can assume she made funny faces at her behind her back and said things like, wow, that outfit makes you look interesting. To top it all off, Catherine got pregnant by Henri and delivered her son just weeks after Marie's first son was born. Now, the king legitimized Catherine's son instead of the queen. Ooh, the burn. The frustrated Queen Marie tried unsuccessfully to expel Catherine from court. Catherine became embroiled in a plot to make her son the king of Spain, but Henri forgave her. It seemed like everything was lining up for a royal shakedown, with Catherine potentially becoming queen and her son eventually king. But then Henri was taken out by a Catholic zealot. He hadn't made too many friends as king and had at least 12 attempts on his life. The last one was clearly the most successful. It usually is. After Henri's demise in 1610, the regent Queen Marie immediately expelled Catherine from court, not wanting things to go on any further in terms of her ambitions to become queen. Catherine lived for another 23 years until she died at age 54, having come very close to becoming the Queen of France through her cunning, but failing in the end. Emperor Gaozu was the first emperor of the Han Dynasty, reigning from 202 to 195 BC. He rose from humble beginnings as a peasant during the Qin Dynasty, eventually marrying Lu Ji, the daughter of his mentor, Master Lu. When rebellions broke out against the Qin, Gaozu took power and eventually became the supreme emperor of China with Lu Ji as his empress. They complemented each other pretty well. Gaozu was a great talent scout and leader, while Lu Ji had excellent political instincts and could eliminate threats with a ruthlessness that was unmatched in the empire. Gaozu and Lu Ji had two children together, Princess Yuan and her son, Lu Ying, the future Emperor Wei. However, Gaozu also had concubines who bore him other sons. One concubine, Lady Qi, had a son named Lu Ruyi. Gaozu favored Lu Ruyi and was considering making him his heir instead of Wei but Gaozu's ministers convinced him to keep Wei as the crown prince before he died in 195 BC. After Gaozu's death, Wei became emperor and Lu Ji became the empress dowager. She needed to tie up some loose ends and Lady Qi and her son were two of them. Plotting and intrigue were thick in the Han Dynasty air. One day, Lu Ji summoned Lu Ruyi to the capital under false pretenses. Emperor Wei was skeptical. Lu Ruyi was his half-brother after all, but the newly crowned emperor eventually did what his mother said, at least in theory. While the emperor was away on business, Lu Ji had Lady Qi's son poisoned. Lu Ji then set her sights on the ex-concubine. She captured Lady Qi and subjected her to some of the worst things imaginable. Lady Qi was locked in a pigsty, telling everyone to refer to her as a human pig until she finally succumbed to the punishment. The whole episode hit Emperor Wei so hard that he became an alcoholic and died shortly after, leaving the reins of the empire to the brutal consort, Lu Ji. Thanks for watching Nutty History. If you enjoy our content, please like, share, and comment. And also comment below about what you want to learn next.